Looks like we're now live. So uh, welcome everyone to the Committee on Taxation. We'll begin as we typically do with the uh, introduction and we'll start. I don't see Senator Libby with us. Uh, Senator Pouliot. Uh, good morning, State Senator Matt Pouliot, represent Senate District 15 in towns of Augusta, China, Oakland, Sydney, and Basboro. Excellent, and Representative Bickford. Good morning, Representative Bruce Bickford. I represent House District 63, which is part of Auburn. Okay. I don't see Representative Carl Michael with us. I see Representative Collings has just joined us. Welcome. Good morning, Representative Benjamin Collings, House District 42, part of Portland. And Representative Gramlick is supposed to be in and out, but I don't see her with us at the moment. Uh, Representative Hanley. Yes, good morning. I'm Jeff Hanley. I represent District 87, which is Piston, Alna, Wiscasset, and Rand. Representative Stetkis is don't believe is with us. Uh, Representative Matlock. Good morning. I'm Ann Matlock. I represent House District 92, which includes the communities of Cushing, Thomaston, South Thomaston, St. George, Matinicus, Creehaven, and the Muscle Ridge Islands. And Representative Perry. Good morning, Joe Perry. I represent part of Orno and part of Bangor in the main house. Okay, and we heard Representative Sachs uh, may not be with us. She's in another committee at the moment. And uh, that brings us to Representative Terry. Good morning. I'm Mo Terry. I represent District 26, the west side of Gorham, uh, and I serve as House Chair on this committee. Um, I just got a little message from Representative Carmichael, and he's just waiting for a link, and he'll be joining us in just a minute. Excellent. And I'm Senator Ben Chipman, serve as Senate Chair of the committee, and I represent Senate District 27, which is part of the city of Portland. Also with us uh, this morning, we have our committee clerk, Lena Braun. And I believe our analyst, Julie Jones. And uh, do you have anything, Representative Terry, before we start? No, I think we're ready to get going. Great. All right. So we're going to begin with a, we have a confirmation hearing followed by some public hearings at 1030. Um, so this is a public hearing of the Joint Standing Committee on Taxation for the purpose of considering the nomination by the governor of Andrew Wells of Durham for reappointment to the main board of tax appeals. Um, under the law and the joint rules of legislature, the committee is required to hold this public hearing and to recommend confirmation or denial of the nominee by majority vote of the committee of members present and voting. As chairs of the committee will then send a written notice of the committee's recommendations to the president of the Senate. The committee will hear testimony from and have an opportunity to question the governor and or their representative, the nominee and any other persons present and wish to speak for or against the nomination. So at this time, uh, entertain a uh, motion pursuant to Title Three, Section 157 of the Maine Statutes it requires it be an affirmative motion to recommend confirmation of the nominee. Um, so moved. Second. We have a, a motion made by Representative Bickard and seconded by Representative Matlack. Um, not, uh, moving forward with the motion to confirm Andrew Wells of Durham for reappointment to the main board of tax appeals. Um, so I would guess we'll now open up testimony uh, from those wishing to speak for or against the nomination. We have someone here from the governor's office. Looks like we do, that's Melissa O'Neill Lowe. Welcome, Ms. O'Neill Lowe. Thank you, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on taxation. My name is Melissa O'Neill Lowe and I am the Director of Boards and Commissions for Governor Janet T. Mills. I'm here today on behalf of the Governor to speak in support of the nomination for reappointment of Andrew Wells, Esquire of Durham, as a member of the Board of Tax Appeals. You may recall that Mr. Wells, Attorney Wells, uh, was just before you about 10 months ago and um, if you're wondering why that is, he went into a midterm seat and as you may know, um, our seats uh, on most boards and commissions are not set uh, by appointment date, they're set in statute. So he um, was, when he was appointed, the term was just about over. So the Board of Tax Appeals can be found in the main revised statutes under Title 36, Chapter 7, Section 151D. The board consists of three members who are appointed by the governor. All members must be residents of Maine and are selected based on their knowledge of and experience in taxation. No more than two members of the board may be members of the same political party. 
Andrew Wells is being reappointed to his current seat on Board of Tax Appeals, seat number three. Attorney Wells received his bachelor's degree from Emory University and went on to attend the University of Maine School of Law where he received his JD. While attending UMaine Law, Attorney Wells was the recipient of the tax award for his outstanding academic performance in tax law. After completing his JD, he then attended the University of Flora, Florida Levin College of Law where he received a master's in law in taxation. Since then, Attorney Wells has worked across Southern Maine in both the legal and financial fields. He has worked as a tax associate for McPage LLC and an independent legal contractor and as the chief financial officer for the Brown Dog in LLC. Attorney Wells currently is an associate at the Portland Law Firm of Bernstein Shore Sawyer Nelson where he practices tax law. It is because of Attorney Wells' breadth of experience in tax law that on behalf of Governor Mills this morning, I would ask that you support the reappointment of Andrew Wells Esquire of Durham. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have this morning. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you for your testimony. The chair would ask if any members of the committee have questions for uh, Ms. O'Neill Lowe. None. Um, Thank you. The chair now recognizes Andrew Wells for the purpose of making a statement concerning his nomination. Welcome, Mr. Wells. Oh, uh, thank you, Senator Chipman. Thank you, uh, Representative Terry. And thank you to the members of the Joint Standing Committee on Taxation. So hi again. Um, my name is Andrew Wells. I'm a native Mainer, and it would be my honor to continue to serve the state um, in the position of uh, as a board member of the Maine uh, Board of Tax Appeals. My continued interest in this position stems from my desire to utilize the, my knowledge and experience that I have accumulated in my career as a tax and business professional, professional uh, for the service of the great state of Maine. Additionally, I relish the opportunity to work uh, within the, continue to work within the tax appeals process in Maine, as well as continuing to deepen my knowledge, my knowledge of the uh, Maine state tax law. Um, you know, I, I, you know, Melissa just did a great job of going over my resume, so I'll, I'll save you all that. But um, when it comes to the, to the business of taxation, I've worked as a legal consultant, an accountant. And I have intimate experience of working and advising our small family businesses here in Maine. Uh, I've had the opportunity to experience the business of taxation from a variety of perspectives, which gives me a unique perspective to work towards practical solutions to tax issues. It is my opinion that my experience and expertise and point of view can be a resource to the state of Maine and continued resource to the Maine Board of Tax Appeals. I also look forward to the opportunity to continue to work as a member of the board. Thank you very much and I'm, I'm available for questions. Great, thank you for that. Mr. Wells, the chair would ask if any member of the committee has questions of the nominee. Seeing none, uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, so statements from the floor, the chair will now take comments from persons attending the hearing who wish to speak for or against the nomination. Uh, is there anyone present who wishes to speak in favor of the nomination? I think we have uh, nobody uh, in this room who is here for that, perhaps on our attendee list though. Lena, do we have anybody that's interested in testifying either for nor against this nomination? Um, Let me see. I don't think so. If there's Nobody. anybody in the attendee room who would like to raise their hand if they want to do that, that's okay too. I don't believe so. So seeing that there's no one else who would like to speak in favor of the nomination, is there anyone who wishes to speak against the nomination? We have, we have your hand up, Representative Bickford. No. Um, is there anyone who wishes to speak uh, speak on the nomination, I guess is the third option. Seeing none, okay. So I guess that um, concludes all the testimony. Uh, we do have a motion already on the floor to uh, confirm the reappointment of Andrew Wells to the Board of Tax Appeals. Um, any discussion from the committee? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor? Uh, this, this would have to be a roll call vote, I believe. So Lena will call off the names and everyone can, can vote accordingly. So if you want to read the roll, Lena. All right. Senator Chipman? Yes. Um, Senator Pouliot? Yes. 
Representative Terry? Yes. Representative Collings? Yes. Um, Representative Matlack? Yes. Representative Perry? Yes. Representative Sachs? Yes. Representative Bickford? Yes. Representative Hanley? Yes. And Representative Carmichael? Yes. All right, there's 10 affirmative. And three. And three, uh, and three absent. Okay, uh, so the, the nomination is confirmed. Um, so we'll now close the public hearing on um, confirmation of Andrew Wells. And uh, thank you so much for everyone for being here with us. Um, Representative Bickford appears to have a question. Yeah, you have a question, Representative Bickford? I do. My question is for Elena. Can you send Joel Stetkis a link to join? <laughs> yeah. Is he included in the list when you send this out? Yep. There's okay. been a problem, I think, sending him out. But um, yeah, I'll send it out again right now. Okay, thank you. No problem. Excellent. Um, so we have concluded uh, the confirmation hearing, but we or advertise the beginning of our public hearing to be for 10.30. So I believe we have to wait until 10.30 before we can- Congratulations, um, Mr. Wells. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much for serving. We appreciate it. It is my pleasure. Congratulations, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. All right. So 15 minutes or 13 yeah. minutes? Yeah, we'll come back at 10.30 and- um, Start back refresh, the hearings. refresh your coffee, everybody. <laughs> do we have a list of what we're going to do for the LDs? What's first? What's second? What's last? Been asked. Uh, have we had any requests for any change in the order? No. Nope. Nope. Okay. We heard from Representative Evans, so he's okay with being third. I haven't heard anything yet. Okay. All right. So we'll just take them in the order that they're listed then. Um, Great. All right. So I guess I guess we'll be at ease until 1030. Sounds good.
Good morning, Melanie. <clears throat> Good morning, Representative Matlack. Hmm. It's going between EUT and tax is sometimes a little different. So <laughs> I apologize, I was a little late while we worked on a bill in EUT and then came for the confirmation hearing. <laughs> Yes. Are you, are you done with EUT for today? I will go back. They're having some um, informational presentations on reports, so I can, okay. I'd prefer to hear the bills here. Yeah, so yeah. I have a good oh, yeah. on those. I can go back and watch the reports later on this afternoon. Uh, Terry, let me know when you think we should uh, get started. We could probably get going anytime. Looks like everybody's close yep. enough that they can at least hear. <laughs> well, we've got 11 members here, so we definitely have quorum, but they're just not on the screen necessarily. Uh, we did have a couple members join us um, since we began at 10 o'clock. Maybe we'd like to let them introduce themselves. I think Representative Sachs wasn't with us then. Would you like to introduce her? Good morning, everyone. Representative Melly Sachs from House District 48, which is Freeport and part of Pownall. I apologize, that it was a wee bit late, Mr. Chair, getting here from Energy Utilities and Technology this morning, committee. Okay. And Representative Carmichael. Good morning, and Representative Mickey Carmichael from District 137, which is 22 communities in Hancock, Washington, and Penobscot counties. And I was a little late because I couldn't get uh, LinkedIn. All right. And Representative Stutkus. Morning. I'm Joel Stutkus. I serve the fine people of District 105, which are the towns of Canaan, Palmyra, St. Albans, Heartland, and Cambridge. Excellent. Great. Well, welcome back, everyone. We're going to uh, proceed with the rest of our schedule for today with public hearings scheduled for 1030. We've got three bills. We'll take them in the order that they're listed on our schedule. Um, and uh, just as a reminder for folks in, in the general public, um, the public hearing is an opportunity for you to share your um, thoughts and ideas around these bills and uh, um, everything's being recorded and uh, everything can be seen and heard as we're, go as we're live on the internet, just a reminder about that. Um, we'll first hear from the sponsor of the bill followed by any co-sponsors and then we'll hear from those who wish to speak for the bill, those who wish to speak against the bill, and finally by those who wish to speak neither for nor against. And after you testify, please stay on with us. There may be questions or things that committee members want clarified. Um, so with that, we will open up the public hearing for LD 1757. This is an act to make technical changes to main tax laws presented by our House Chair Representative Terry. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Maureen Terry, and I represent um, District 26, uh, the west part of Gorham, and I am here to present LD 1757, an act to make technical changes to the main tax laws. It is the department bill best spoken about with the department. <laughs> uh, so uh, with that being said, I'm happy to answer any questions but will not likely be able to answer any of them. <laughs> okay, any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for that, Representative Terry. Um, so I guess, uh, I don't think we have any co-sponsors here. I'm not sure there are any co-sponsors on the bill, but um, we'll now hear testimony in support of the bill and we'll hear from, um, looks like Mr. D'Alessandro has signed up to speak in favor of the bill from MRS. Welcome, Mr. D'Alessandro. Um, thank you. Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, and members of the Taxation Committee, good morning. I'm Daniel D'Alessandro, Associate Tax Policy Counsel for the Office of Tax Policy. I'm here today at the request of the administration to testify in support of LD 1757, an act to make technical changes to main tax laws. 
1757 is legislation submitted by the department. As you know, Maine Revenue Services prepares one or more bills each year that propose changes to various existing provisions of Maine law. These changes are made primarily to Title 36. The purpose of LD 1757 is to make various technical improvements and clarifications consistent with existing tax administration and other tax related executive branch functions. The department has also submitted another bill, an act to amend the tax laws of the state. The difference between the two bills is the nature of the recommendations. Whereas the act to amend contains substantive changes, this bill contains a technical, non-substantive or administrative changes to Maine's tax laws. These changes have no impact on the tax receipts included in the baseline revenue forecast by the Revenue Forecasting Committee. The present bill before you, LD 1757, makes technical changes to clarify statutory language consistent with ongoing administrative practice, enact necessary administrative provisions, improve syntax, and repeal unnecessary and outdated language. You should have in your folders a chart prepared by MRS that breaks down each provision of the bill and matches it with corresponding paragraphs from the bill's summary section. This side-by-side -side chart provides a brief explanation of each provision of the bill. Um, the administration looks forward to working with the committee on the bill. Representatives from MRS will be here for the work session to provide additional information and respond in detail to the committee's questions. I can briefly go through the side-by-side -side chart now take your questions on selected provisions or wait to address any questions you might have at the work session. I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have now. Uh, okay. Um, Representative Terry, do you think we should have maybe Julie put the chart up and go through that or should we wait to the work session? Um, well, actually I'd like to ask Daniel which which he would prefer, honestly. I mean, I, I we do have um, a member of the public that's here to testify or that's not here to testify, but that did put in written testimony. Um, so perhaps, Daniel, it might not be a bad idea to go through that chart just super quick. So if there's anything that we need to discuss with that member of the public or anybody else, we can do so. Okay. Um, it's a pretty short summary, so I think that makes, I can go through that. Yeah, well, can we get, is it possible to put that up on the screen, either yourself or um, our analyst, Julie, um, so we can look at that as we as you go through it? Yeah, Daniel, we don't have folders anymore. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. It looks like we have it up on the screen now. So yeah, that would, that would be great. Thank you. Um, part eight of this bill repeals a provision that authorizes main revenue services to divulge certain taxpayer information to the treasurer of state for the purpose of administering the main unclaimed or abandoned property law. This information would often include federal tax information which under federal restrictions may not be divulged. So this provision isn't currently being used. Section B1 reduces the mandatory number of assessor certification exams Maine Revenue Services is required to hold from four to two per year. Sections B2, B3, B5, and B6 make technical changes such as removing obsolete references to the state property tax removing gender specific references and other obsolete language. And section B4 clarifies the amount of tax that must be paid when a tax fair appeals into denial of abatement. This doesn't change the amount that must be paid. It just clarifies the language, which is, is pretty clunky right now. So I have a quick question. Um, yeah, go ahead, Representative Terry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Daniel, can you tell us just a little bit about the mandatory number of assessor certification exams? Are we just not using four at this point? Um, All right, so the number, with the number of assessors seeking certification, um, it doesn't really make sense from our point of view to have four of these um, per year. Uh -huh. I, I did just see the uh, testimony from MMA on this on this uh, provision. So I would like uh, between now and the work session to discuss it with them. Okay, terrific. So, uh, Mr. D'Alessandro, is it like each assessor, I mean, everyone has to get certified, but they wouldn't need more than one a year. It sounds like you're proposing to reduce from four to two because there isn't enough need to warrant holding four a year. Is that correct? Right, to have just, just to how many um, exams we have to run each year. 
And so there just aren't enough people seeking the certification to warrant holding four exams per year. Okay. Um, any other questions from members of the committee for Mr. Delisandro? Seeing none, um, thank you for your testimony and look forward to hearing more at the work session and hopefully we can work something out with MMA and satisfy their, their concerns. Um, so we don't have anybody else signed up to speak in favor of the bill um, and we don't have anybody signed up to speak against the bill or neither for nor against the bill. Um, is there anybody- I was sharing and I couldn't figure out how to stop and I clicked on this thing and I got this, but I still don't have you know, any of the stuff that tells it's me to share and stuff. Okay, that's um, where it's okay to me. Representative Sachs, go ahead. Can you click on that second one? Oh, no, not that one. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to reiterate that I'm, I'm hopeful that the department can talk with May Municipal Association. It does feel like the threshold of um, having perhaps one bad day and then having to take retake the test, there may not be ample opportunity. And if they only last the certification for a year, um, I, I just want to make sure that they're, I don't know if it's just the utilization and if the department is able to come up with some data that say it's really, really not being utilized so that there's really no, no need for cutting it down to four from four mm -hmm. to two, but we just like some clarification around that. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely uh, agree with that as well. Um, so we don't have anybody else, uh, as I said, signed to speak for the bill against the bill and either for nor against the bill. So we'll now close the public hearing on LD 1757 and we'll open up the public hearing on LD 1917. This is an act to amend the tax laws of the state also sponsored by our chair, Representative Terry. Uh, welcome back, Representative Terry. Well, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, once again, my name is Mo Terry. I represent District 26, the west side of Gorham, and I am here to present LD 1917, an act to amend the tax laws of the state. Um, again, a department bill, uh, so questions are best asked by, uh, to Mr. D'Alessandro. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Representative Terry. Questions for uh, Representative Terry? Seeing none, um, thank you for your testimony. Um, and we don't have any co-sponsors um, to speak. So we'll now take testimony from those in support of LD 1917, starting with uh, Mr. D'Alessandro from MRS. Welcome back. Um, thank you. Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, members of the Taxation Committee, good morning again. I'm Daniel D'Alessandro, Associate Tax Policy Counsel for the Office of Tax Policy. I'm here today at the request of the administration to testify in support of LD 1917, an act to amend the tax laws of the state. LD 1917 is legislation submitted by the department. Um, it's one of the bills that we prepare each year. Um, you just heard LD 1757, our technical changes bill. Um, the difference between these bills is the nature of the recommendations. The LD 1757 contains the technical changes with little or no fiscal impact. Um, this act to amend makes various minor but substantive improvements and clarifications consistent with existing tax administration and other tax related executive department fu functions. Enactment of this bill would have a negligible impact on state revenues. Um, you should have available to you a chart prepared by MRS that breaks down each provision of the bill it matches it with a corresponding paragraph from the bill's summary section. This side-by-side -side chart provides a brief explanation of each provision of the bill. You should also have a proposed committee amendment, which makes technical corrections to the original bill regarding the treatment of insurance companies incorporated in another country. It maintains the current law treatment of deeming said companies to be incorporated in the United States in certain circumstances. The administration looks forward to working with the committee on the bill. Representatives from MRS will be here for the work session to provide additional information and respond in detail to the committee's questions. I can briefly go through the side-by-side -side chart now, take your questions on selected provisions or wait to address any questions you might have at the work session. Um, I, yeah, could you bring that up, Julie, so we can do the same with this bill, just, just a brief summary of each with Mr. D'Alessandro and any questions folks might have.
So Julie, that's our the last one. Yeah, this is the previous chart. It looks like we still have that on the screen. Is there a way to switch this over with the uh, chart for this bill? And you're on mute too, Julie. Here we are, 1917. Sorry, there it is. Perfect. Thank you. So having much. my usual problems with sharing for some reason. I'm not sure what's going on, but you've got it now, right? Yeah, we do. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Um, so, Section A1 and A2 of the bill specify that for tax periods beginning on or after January 1st, 2023, premium contracts sold on insurance producers through non admitted insurers and premiums paid by insureds on self-procured contracts from non-admitted insurers are subject to tax at the higher of Maine's tax rate and the tax rate of the state of incorporation of the insurance company that is underwriting the policy. Um, right now, there is a difference between how non-admitted and admitted insurers are uh, treated, and this would align the two. So you'd have the same uh, treatment for the non-admitted insurers. Um, the proposed amendment makes technical corrections to uh, to these provisions, maintaining the current law treatment of deeming said companies to be incorporated in the United States in certain circumstances. Section A3 increases the withholding rate applicable to certain gambling winnings subject to main tax from 5% of the winnings to the highest marginal tax rate applicable during the tax year um, of which the winnings are made plus any other tax in part eight related to income taxes. Generally, the 5% withholding rate on gambling winnings may be insufficient to cover a taxpayer's tax liability. And when with withholding is insufficient, taxpayers may be required to make estimated tax payments. Requiring both withholding and estimated tax payments on the same income is inefficient and burdensome on both MRS and the taxpayer. And this proposal does not change the taxpayer's ultimate tax liability. Section B1 requires municipalities to annually provide information needed by MRS to conduct state valuations, and it removes an obsolete reference to the state property tax. We've this is- a, We've got a question from Senator Pouliot, maybe in one of the previous. Go ahead, Senator Pouliot. Thanks, yeah, um, back on the, on the last one, uh, what is the difference between admitted and non-admitted insurers? Um, right. Uh, a non-admitted insurer is an insurer that does not have a certif certificate of authority to do business in Maine um, from the superintendent of insurance. And an admitted insurance um, is somebody that does have a certificate. Not admitted insurance signs can be sold in the state, but only in limited circumstances. The primary ones are through admitted insurance. Uh, Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. D'Alessandro, on the gambling winnings, why would, wouldn't that be just treated as ordinary income? I mean, is that assuming that someone that wins over, I think the threshold is $600, that those monies, they're going to be at the top end of the threshold? Um, so when the tax is... Liability is calculated at the end of the year. You're right. It's just going to be treated as any other income. Oh, okay. But when they receive the payment, a certain amount of tax is withheld from the payment, and then they have to file at the end of the return to get it back if it's too much or to pay additional if it's too low, similar to how wages is. Okay, so this, okay. Thank you very much. Any additional questions to members of the committee? Um, don't see any at this point. So if you want to continue on, Mr. Alessandro. Um, so B1 requires mis municipalities to provide information needed by MRS to conduct state valuations. This is consistent with um, current practice. Section B2 and B4 removes the requirement for benevolent and charitable institutions to be incorporated in Maine to be exempt from property taxation. This item was originally proposed in the 129th first uh, session and due to the serious constitutional concerns with the with current law, we're proposing to repeal it again. 
Well, we have a question from Representative Sachs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. D'Alessandro, so can you just elaborate on that a little bit? There was, so there's a constant, I wasn't in the 129th, so forgive me for those that, that is retread uh, territory, but so at the time this was introduced in the 129th, but um, it's a constitutional question that you're treating charitable institutions that are incorporated outside of Maine differently than those that are, and that's a constitutional issue. Right. So this is a longstanding property tax exemption for uh, benevolent and charitable institutions. And the statute requires them to be incorporated in Maine, as opposed to being incorporated in another state. And that raises um, serious constitutional concerns because it's discriminating against the entity just based on which state it's incorporated in. And so under the federal uh, dormant commerce clause, that, that raises significant concerns. In the 129th first, we proposed repealing the requirement that they be incorporated in Maine. And it, that did not get enacted at that point, but we're proposing it again because of those constitutional concerns. And Mr. D'Alessandro, the reason stated for not doing it in the, when, was it because of the COVID um, interruption or was it defeated? Um, if there was an amendment in committee to, to remove it from the bill at that, at that time. All right, I guess we can continue. Section B3 allows assessors to request information from taxpayers regarding, regarding property qualifying for an exemption that is subject to full or partial reimbursement under section 706A of Title 36. Right now that section only applies to Betty eligible property, business equipment, tax exemption property and taxable property that is non-exempt property. Um, but the assessors need to get that information so they can properly value it and provide that information to Maine Revenue Services so that the state can reimburse them for, uh, for some portion of the exemption. Oh, we have a couple of questions, uh, Representative Terry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. D'Alessandro, is that just for uh, business taxpayers or is that for... Um, uh, regular taxpayers as well? This would primarily be for business taxpayers, but it could be for any. For instance, there's an exemption for solar equipment. Right. The, the assessor might need to value that so that the municipality could be reimbursed from the state for, the, uh, for some of the cost. Okay. Representative Bickford has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. D'Alessandro, can you explain what the change in information gathering for Betty, for example, would be? Um, so there would be no change. Than, right. There would be no change to um, Betty and taxable property. Right now, the assessors, the local property tax assessors can request information on Betty property and taxable property. This would just add additional property to what they can request. And that would be any property that's exempt and subject to reimbursement from the state. So one example would be the solar property. And what information would they be asking for? Well, so they can ask for a list of what the property is and, and information about that property, like the cost. Okay, so just relating to the property? Right, yes. Okay, thank you. If we can continue now. And so we covered before, that's uh, benevolent and charitable institutions. Section B5 replaces the term homestead with the term permanent residence in Title 36, Section 6234 regarding municipal benefits to veterans to better align the definition with the benefit to renters allowed under that section. This was a program enacted last year, and it uses a homestead definition, which doesn't include renters but the program does provide benefits to renters. And so the, the proper term here is permanent residence. Section B6 strikes the provision under the deferred collection of homestead property taxes applying to the uh, normal property tax abatement and appeals process to situations in which the state tax assessor disagrees with the municipal evaluation of a property subject to deferral. 
regarding requiring the state to appeal to a municipality would create an odd dynamic and would be unlikely to occur. And there are already other informal and potentially formal avenues for the uh, state tax assessor to uh, work with the assessors to address any problematic assessments. So this appeal route is not necessary. Um, part C is quite a bit of statutory text. Um, it expands the penalty free reclassification of land taxed under the main tree growth tax law and farm and open space law to include reclassifications into and out of working waterfront land without incurring a penalty. In addition, it clarifies and aligns the penalty free, the penalty provisions for tree growth, farm and open space, and working waterfront current use classifications. There is a lot of text here, but the overall impact is limited. The substantive change is to allow penalty-free transfers into and out of working waterfront. Currently, when you're in a current use program like tree growth and you leave it, you need to pay a penalty. But if you move from tree growth to, say, farm and open space, then you don't have to pay a penalty. So this, will, this brings uh, working waterfront into that penalty-free transfer. Um, and the penalty provision for farm and open space is also heavily reformatted to align with the other provisions, but it's not substantively changed. And then there are a lot of provisions here that are just updating cross references and making other conforming changes. To that. And I, I did note that there was one testimony, I think, suggesting uh, a technical change to some of this here. And so we'll work with the uh, with the uh, people making that testimony between now and the work session. Um, part D changes the monthly transfer of sales tax revenue to the ATV Recreational Management Fund to a biannual transfer beginning July 1st, 2023 of sales tax revenue from the prior fiscal year and clarifies that the transfer is reduced by the transfer to the local government fund. This is a transfer that was created last session and there are two transfers that overlap, the transfer to the multimodal fund and the transfer to the ATV Recreational Management Fund. And they're, right now they're on different schedules and the way they overlap makes that difficult to administer. And due to the low amount of the, of the transfer, it doesn't really make sense to be doing monthly transfers to the ATV Transfer Fund. This doesn't change the amount that will eventually go to the funds, but it does align both transfers to happen at the same time and makes it easier to make sure that the same revenue doesn't get transferred to both funds. And importantly, it also clarifies that the transfer is reduced by the transfer to the local government fund. Otherwise, over 100% of the revenue might be transferred to various funds. We have a question from Representative Terry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to be clear, Daniel, that the multimodal fund is a biannual transfer, yes, and we want to put the ATV in line with that as well. Uh, or, no, okay, gotcha. Thank you. And that's that's all I have. Okay, great. Well, thanks for your presentation and your testimony, and any additional questions from members of the committee. Not seeing any. Um, oh, but Representative Stetkus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do have a, uh, a request probably for the work session, mm -hmm. uh, Bill, and it goes back to uh, uh, the gambling winnings raising the uh, top tax rate compared to the, the current rates. And I was wondering if the department could provide us with how many current cases uh, where winners are overtaxed and have to uh, have their uh, have those uh, legal earnings returned as compared to and, and how many, I guess, on the other side, uh, how many are being undertaxed and have to pay in, pay in more. Uh, I, have a, I have a concern of, uh, of uh, you know, some of our some of our neighbors having the state government hold their legal earnings for multiple months uh, by being overtaxed if it's not, if it's not a current uh, problem. Okay. Um, we can get that information 
the uh, the goal of the withholding is to to withhold the correct amount of tax, not to over or under withhold it. We can get that information for the work session. Yeah, I mean, just to clarify, because you're talking about the withholding, I mean, this doesn't change the, the tax rates so and no one's being overtaxed or undertaxed. It's the withholding amount being too much or too less, right? Seems like. Um, if, if I'm under, if I could, uh, to clarify, thanks for that explanation. So if I'm understanding this right, currently, if, uh, you know, somebody wins, a th I'm not a gambler, so I don't follow this at all, but um, if somebody wins $1,000, they're being withheld. They're uh, instantly, basically, they're they're being withheld five percent currently. Is that correct? Um, the threshold is higher than one thousand dollars, but that's okay. But yes, and that so and what what this is proposing is to raise that to seven point one five instead of five percent. Yes. Okay. okay. So so I guess that, to me anyway, it would make sense to find out. How many people? How many people? You know, at the end of the year, the five percent tax was not enough as compared to too much. We, we can get that information. Actually, tax zero in the state of Maine, as you know. So, All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Perry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to follow up on that, uh, in your testimony, you talked about winnings might potentially trigger the requirement for additional withholdings. Now, someone who runs a business has to do quarterlies and such. People who are maybe just have a normal job and win some money probably aren't familiar with uh, additional withholdings. If, if, if this did trigger a requirement for additional withholdings, is there a penalty if you don't do that, if you under withhold? Yes, there is a penalty. Right, And so that's, that's the other side of it. If you're under withheld on this income and this would be important if you had a substantial winning, then you need to make estimated tax payments throughout the year to cover that tax that's due. And if you fail to make those, there are penalties and, or there can be penalties. It depend, does depend on the circumstances, but you're right. Somebody who is normally has just wage income, their withholding covers that wage income. They wouldn't normally be making estimated tax payments. And if they had gambling win income and were under withheld, they would have to make those estimated tax penalties, which would be a new, a new burden on them. So this could uh, avoid someone being penalized potentially because enough wasn't taken out or withheld? Right. It could, it could avoid them having to make those estimated tax payments. And if they failed to make those, it could avoid, avoid any possible penalties. Hmm. Okay. I don't see any additional questions. So uh, thanks for your testimony and, um, being here with us this morning. Um, nobody else has signed up to speak in favor, and we don't have anybody to speak in opposition, but we do have somebody signed up to speak neither for nor against, Tom Doak from the Maine Woodland Owners. Is Mr. Doak with us? Yes, I just moved him over. There we go. Great. Welcome, Tom Doak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Chair Chipman, Chair Terry, members of the Taxation Committee, my name is Tom Doak. I'm the Executive Director of Maine Woodland Owners. Um, my comments are entirely about Section C4. Um, um, we have no other issues uh, with the bill. And frankly, we just want to bring one item to the attention of the committee. Uh, and it relates specifically to the Trico Tax Law Program. Uh, many of you are aware that the Trico Tax Law Program is reviewed by this committee almost every year. Um, and um, um, we, a lot of work has gone into um, the language that's in the statute. The, there have been numerous reviews of the Trico tax law program and, and there's a very high compliance rate, but there is, um, uh, there, there is a requirement, frankly, it's the one program where a, a landowner must recertify every 10 years. One of the one of the current use taxation programs that requires recertification by landowners every 10 years. So, the, there is a, uh, the assessor has to notify the landowner um, of this 10 year window and what they need to do to comply. And what one change that was specifically made by this committee was in that notice to indicate that the assessor should indicate if you're not able to comply with the tree growth or don't want to comply with the tree growth program, the open space program is available there for you and what you would need to do to, to, to move into that. Um, 
the way this is written, it just simply talks about another program, another current use taxation program and removes that message about open space. Um, we think that's been a helpful change to the statute. It, 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 has, it kind of gives people direction of where to go. It would be highly unlikely that someone would move from tree growth. I, I can't imagine going from tree growth to working waterfront, which is one of the current use taxation programs and pretty unlikely to go from tree growth to farmland. So open space really is the place and you will lose that kind of guidance if you do it this way. Our suggestion is you might consider leaving that in the notice requirement, leaving the, leaving the reference to open space instead of making it more generic. I, I think that would help move people that are better off in the open sp space program than tree growth to move there. It's not a huge issue, but we think the change that you worked on diligently a couple of years ago has been positive and we would hate to lose that. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Excellent, any questions from members of the committee? Representative Terry? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for being here, Mr. Doak, and, and bringing that up. Um, I do recall working hard on that. <laughs> um, can, um, uh, will you, um, it sounds like Mr. D'Alessandro is interested in discussing it with you as well. Will you uh, be able to have a conversation with him about that? Absolutely. I'd be happy to. Yes, I, we agree with the intent. So we'll just, it's probably just a language tweak would be Terrific. helpful. Great. Any additional questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for being with us, Mr. Doak. Good to see you. Um, we don't have anybody else signed up to testify on this bill, so we'll now close the public hearing on LD 1917. And oh, it's already. Mr. Chair, sure, I have a quick question oh, okay. uh, before we moved. That was more general, not specifically to Mr. Doak, but I noticed that May Municipal had um, also testified, and I didn't know if they were here and going to be testifying either for or against on this bill. Um, and just so for the work session, um, uh, it is my hope that Mr. D'Alessandro will connect that with the information that they've requested and bring that back to the committee. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Uh, so we will now uh, open up the public hearing on LD 1919, our final bill that we're hearing this morning. This is an act to encourage job growth in the forest product sector through tax incentives sponsored by Representative Evans. So we'll hear from Representative Evans followed by Anyone else who'd like to testify on the bill is Representative Evans with us. I'm on mute. No. <laughs> He's not with us. Okay. No. Oh, he is. Where did I? Oh, there he is. I couldn't he see him. He's raised his hand. So he oh, to... I was I missed him. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think it should be. There you go. Oh. Great. So welcome, Representative Evans. Thank you. I got stuck in the wormhole. Um, Senator Chipman, uh, Representative Terry, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Taxation. I am Dr. Richard Evans, and I represent uh, House District 120, uh, which includes the towns of Atkinson, Brownville, Dover, Foxcroft, Medford, Milo, and Orneville Township. I thank you for the opportunity to come before you today to present LD 1919, an act to encourage job growth in the forest products sector through tax incentives. The forestry industry is a major backbone of Maine and Maine's economy. As recently as 2019, the forest products industry was responsible for nearly 32,000 jobs and contributed roughly $8 billion to Maine's economy. However, the industry was hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic with an estimated 30 to 40% de uh, decline in available markets for harvested wood and a 19% decrease in revenue for paper mills. Fortunately, um, the uh, governor's office uh, acted by uh, pledging uh, $20 million in relief uh, to forest products businesses that have, have been uh, negatively affected by the pandemic. Uh, despite this, however, we still need to do more. And I think that uh, LD 1919 would entitle uh, forest products business employees who work a minimum of 900 hours in a calendar year to be eligible for reimbursement 
of training and equipment costs. The goal of this bill is to provide an added incentive to the forestry industry to provide support and to encourage the hiring and training of new employees. I know that this will not solve uh, either the labor shortage or the need for increased workforce development in this industry or in our state as a whole. However, I do believe that by providing an additional tool to an industry that is an economic engine, particularly in the rural parts of our state, uh, we can take a small step uh, forward toward meeting those goals. Um, as you can see from the original bill draft, my intent was to house this incentive inside the existing ETF, uh, ETF uh, program. But after collaborating uh, with other interested parties, including the uh, Department of Economic and Community Development, I would recommend to the committee that rather than being housed as part of, of ETIF, it be made a standalone program. Uh, by so doing, the bill would simply become a new tax credit with the same goals, but placed in a different section of the tax code uh, with the uh, many existing credits. This change, I believe, will avoid any confusion for businesses are removing what would be an add-on to ETIF and uh, making it its own standalone tax credit. Uh, finally, I would ask that the committee consider changing the requirement for eligible businesses from, from uh, adding one new position to adding uh, three new positions. Um, uh, after speaking with those in the industry, they feel that this change will provide opportunities for businesses of all sizes to grow and help to, pro to provide stability in the, sex, in the uh, sector. And I am in, a, in agreement with this recommended change. Um, finally, um, item 12 um, references uh, qualified employees uh, as noted in the original draft of the bill. Um, item B uh, in this section uh, states that for an employee hired in this state by the qualified business who is employed for at least 900 hours in a calendar year by the qualified business. In order to ensure consistency uh, and that there is no ambiguity in this definition, I would uh, recommend to the committee uh, that uh, you consider inserting the phrase uh, meets the eligibility conditions specified in the main employment security law well, with the remainder of the section continuing as printed uh, in the draft. All of, the, of, all of these uh, recommendations are included uh, in my written uh, testimony uh, that I submitted to the uh, committee. So I thank the committee for your time and, and consideration, and I would be happy to answer any questions that I can that you may have. Uh, there will be others uh, to follow me uh, who I'm certain will be more capable of answering more technical questions and I will be available for the work session. And with that, I will yield back to the chair. Great, thank you, Representative Evans. We have a question from Representative Bickford followed by Representative Terry. Go ahead, Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Evans, my question is, um, first of all, I think we've heard this bill before. Uh, sounds pretty familiar. Um, do we have any constitutional issues if we are isolating this only to two counties and not making it broad throughout the state? Well, I, I'm not aware of any constitutional uh, issues, but it includes the industry itself, which is statewide. Okay, because when I looked at the bill, it specifically isolated two counties. Well, it, looking uh, at the bill, I re recall uh, Piscataquis County, Aroostook right. County, Washington County, uh, but it's uh, okay. th those those counties um, have a call system, and that's why I think that that was uh, uh, amplified. But the industry, the the bill references is in designed for all forestry industries across the state. Okay, so if there are any issues county-wise, 
would you recommend that we take out specific counties and make it available to the entire state that has forestry? Or uh, also in the bill, there was a, a piece for call centers. Um, would that be available to the entire state? That would be available to the entire state as I understand the bill. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Terry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Evans, for bringing this to us. We appreciate it. Um, the, um, you had mentioned that um, the bill includes language for one new position and you're recommending three new positions. Um, is, that, is that an amendment that you're bringing to us or would you like us to work that in? I would uh, prefer that you work it in. And the reason is after discussing uh, with uh, uh, stakeholders, they felt that that would be a, a better uh, a approach for, for them. And I think that that's a reasonable approach. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Sachs. Thank you so much. And good morning, Dr. Evans. Nice to see you this morning. Good morning. I um, had a question. I just wanted to reference something in your testimony. Number one, I have not seen the written testimony. Um, so I don't know, Julie, if that's placed somewhere. I've looked in all the normal haunts um, for committee materials for that particular piece. But number two, I just wanted to clarify, make sure I understood you correctly, Dr. Evans, around um, is the intent of the bill is not for workforce um, enhancement. So can you help me understand sort of the nugget of what you feel this bill does? Well, I think that the intent is to increase or help increase the training uh, to expand the workforce for the industry. And especially smaller businesses um, that uh, cannot uh, uh, don't feel that they can um, go through the extended process of uh, qualifying um, for uh, any types of credits. So this gives them the opportunity uh, at a smaller business level to expand their businesses. Thank you. That's a good clarification. We had a question from Representative Hanley. Yes. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, good morning, Dr. Evans. Thank Good you morning. Uh, my question is uh, about the, uh, it excludes businesses that are in retail operation, unless it's, uh, they can be uh, in retail sales, but as long as it doesn't exceed 50%. Why are we setting that kind of benchmark? How come, and I'm thinking specifically of like Hunt Lumber here, uh, you know, down in Wiscasset, excuse me, Whitefield, that they, they have a, a sawmill and a retail lumber mill, a lumber store. But you know, unless they fall under a 50% margin, they wouldn't be able to utilize this. Why are we going to exclude people like that or an organization like that? Well, thank you for that question. I'm not certain. I can't give you a definitive answer, but I would suspect that they may be uh, already qualifying under a different uh, a code, but don't hold me to that. Uh, I think someone uh, following would probably be able to better answer that question. Thank you, I'll, I'll do that, thanks. A question from our analyst, Julie Jones. Hi. Um, um, Representative Evans mentioned um, the amendment and, writ and written testimony. Um, and I think Representative Sachs asked if that was available. Um, I'm actually not finding that myself. So I'm not sure where it has been submitted, but it is not on the list of information that was submitted online with regard to this bill. So it may have been submitted in a different way and I'm not sure how, but. I'm unable to I, locate it as well. Okay. I will, as soon as I get off, I will make sure that you get that. It should have, it should have been there. Okay, great. I'll, I'll make sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, seeing no additional questions. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Dr. Evans, it's good to see you. Thank um, you. So we'll uh, um, now hear from um, 
co-sponsors of the bill. I believe we have one signed up, Senator Jackson. And if you can, Lena, please also bring into the room who will be following Senator Jackson, Michelle McLean from the Maine Forest Products Council, followed by Tom Doak, Maine Woodland owners. If we can have them also brought in so we can keep things moving along, that would be great. Welcome, Senator Jackson. <clears throat> Uh, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Taxation. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. As you know, my name is Troy Jackson. I have the great honor of representing Northern Rooster County and serving as President of the Maine Senate. I'm here to testify in favor of LD 1919, an act that encouraged job growth in the forest product sector through tax incentives. And I'm very uh, honored to uh, be a co-sponsor with uh, Dr. Evans. And I appreciate him uh, putting forward something like this. You know, for generations, families like mine have worked hard to make a good living in the Maine woods. However, the forest products industry has changed dramatically since my father, great grandfather and great grandfather first went to work in the woods. New technology, a changing market and a shift in demand for forest products has forced the industry to, uh, as a whole, evolve. Yet it remains a critical part of the state's ec economy. Part of the challenge with a production-based industry is that contractors often feel like they can't ask for what they deserve or any change in the status quo. Even this past summer, when lumber prices rose to an all-time high, few contracts saw an increase in wages or benefits. The other key issue is that there is a need to Unfortunately, keep equipment running sometimes 24 hours a day uh, on this production-based um, system in order to keep the production and maximize uh, profits. This makes it very difficult to train workers, which costs time and money. As a result, we've gone from a system where training workers was a part of the job to a system where training workers is simply not practical for existing contractors who are barely scraping by. LD 1919 has a simple goal, to create jobs and provide training for Maine workers in the forest products industry. The proposal would relax eligibility for requirements for employers in the forest products industry to qualify for an existing program designed to support new and established businesses to hire trained workers in order to apply for the employment tax increment financing under the new proposal an employer in the forest products industry would only need to hire one new employee that works a minimum of 900 hours a year. This could go a long way in creating jobs and incentivizing the higher main workers. I understand that Dr. Evans has probably wanted to create a new, um, a new tax incentive, and, I, and that's fine. I was obviously speaking from the original uh, bill. I do have concerns as the bill's written that it could be used in a way that it could jeopardize uh, current main jobs. It's why I would also, as Dr. Evans has suggested, urge the committee to include language to ensure that a qualified employee meets the eligibility conditions specified in the employment security law. In addition, other requirements outlined in text, this will, this will ensure that employers are gonna take advantage of this expanded eligibility our reward for hiring Maine workers and not using Maine taxpayer dollars to create jobs for Canadian workers. It also puts Maine workers on a level playing field with Canadian workers that often have the advantage due to an affordable exchange rate and nationalized healthcare systems. Um, I obviously, you know, just wanted to say that when I, um, you know, started back in 1987, uh, running mechanical harvesting equipment. Uh, the, everyone that I understood in the area um, trained workers by on-the-job training. Uh, that was how you got, you know, the, the training. And, and it was pretty much accepted practice that you would go and, you know, spend time with experienced operators, uh, understanding how to uh, run the equipment. Um, it really has gotten to a point where it's really hard with the pay structure for uh, a contractor to um, do that now because they they you know they can't afford to not be cutting a wood or lemon wood or whatever their job is uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, so I think that um, you know what Dr. Evans is putting forward, uh, you know, could help uh, subsidize the loss in production that it takes to train. 
uh, some of these workers. I think um, the one thing that I might disagree with them on, and I'm certainly open to your interpretation, is the three or more. Um, I think there's an awful lot of uh, contractors in the industry that uh, are owner operators and, and need to hire one more person for the 24 hour a day type of system. Um, you know, they're not gonna be able to hire three. And, and I, I just think that's gonna leave an awful lot of people out of the, the program that, um, you know, really could use uh, this type of benefit. So, you know, I, I'm sure I'll be supportive of whatever the committee comes up with, but, uh, but I do think that going to uh, three or more employees is going to knock an awful lot of uh, small business owners out that really could use the, the help. And that's why I would uh, at least encourage a conversation uh, in that way. So with that, I'll, uh, you know, certainly take any questions and uh, look forward to uh, the committee's work. Great. Thank you, Senator Jackson. We have a question from Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning still. Senator Jackson, it's good to see you. Same here. Um, how um, how would you react if uh, if maybe it was negotiated to two employees from three? Would that fit you a little bit better? It, it obviously definitely would, uh, but like I said, uh, you know, just understand, you know, for all of you, like someone that obviously has a fellow buncher that may, and there's a lot of people that just has that just as a grapple or just as a truck. And, and especially on the trucking side, uh, many of the large landowners require, well, not many, some re require a 24 hour a day system. So you really only have uh, the ability to hire one more person. And, and so in that job, it, it's, uh, you know, you're hiring one more, it's a two person job, but one's um, uh, the employer owner operator and the other person is uh, the employee of that. And so you're really just hiring one more person in, in a lot of these cases. And, and obviously two would be better than three. Uh, it would capture more people. I really think that there's a chance here that a lot of really small logging businesses will be left out uh, if it isn't one, but it's better than, better than where we are now. Okay, it's noted and uh, it's good to see you, Senator. Same here, sir. Uh, we have a question from Representative Terry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, uh, President Jackson, for being here as well. So just so I get a better picture of what the industry itself is like that would benefit from a pr from this program, um, as far as small businesses go versus the bigger businesses, are, are, is there like a large percentage of very small operators like the ones that you're talking about? Um, you know, in my business, uh, it's just me, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm, my, I'm my whole entire business. So for me, hiring three employees is not possible. I would never do it, or at least mm -hmm. not for a very long time. Um, uh, but there's a lot of me in my business. There's a lot of, of really tiny businesses around. Um, in the forest products, my, my thought of it, because I have zero experience with it, is there's these big operators that do all of this work. Um, so can you give me like a picture of what the, what it looks like in the middle of the summer there, as far as companies go, or are there a bunch of little guys, a bunch of big guys, or a combination of all of them? Sure. I, th I think, uh, you know, in certain parts of the state, uh, you have uh, larger contractors, um, but, but throughout the state, uh, you have a whole bunch of uh, owner operators um, that own trucks, own mechanical harvesting equipment. Um, and so in my area, I mean, there's all kinds of people that are just, just that they, they own the equipment and, and they're the only ones, uh, they're, they're definitely as bigger contractors that own like in, in, um, uh, on the harvesting side, they'll own a whole tree system where they'll have the fellow buncher, the delimiter and, and maybe two grapples. Um, and so they got, you know, four or more employees running, running those, um, and, uh, other, other, uh, systems that are like a, a processor outfit where it'll have the processor and the forwarder, 
Uh, maybe it has a fellow buncher with that too. So you have three or more contractors in that uh, system, but you have a lot of those uh, in my area too that are subcontracted where uh, somebody will own just a fellow buncher uh, or somebody will own just a grapple uh, or like, I mean, my son only owns a fellow buncher. My brother-in-law only owns a delimmer. Uh, and that's, that's throughout the, you know, the St. John Valley, uh, Rooster County area, you'll have just those um, one person owner operators. And on the trucking side, I think it's even higher. I mean, just individuals that uh, only own the truck, uh, but oftentimes have to run that as a 24 hour day system. So they have to hire one, if not two other drivers uh, to, to be able to even uh, operate under some of these landowners conditions. So it, it is a hodgepodge across the state. I understand that there's a lot of bigger contractors that three or more uh, works really good for, but I think you're going to leave an awful lot of small uh, independent owners out if you only go to three. Thank you very much. Representative Sachs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning again, Mr. President. Having seen you in EUT this morning as well. Is it for you? <laughs> um, I, so the nature of this bill really changes for me that it came out of the, the an ETIF program. Um, and is now just a straight tax credit. I'm glad to see Representative Evans is still here because perhaps this can be a conversation for the work session. But how does this bill, we spent a lot of time on apprenticeship and it made me think of that when you were talking about the cost of taking somebody on. There's now enormous incentives for bringing people on at any level, regardless of number of positions under the apprenticeship program. Plus we have property tax, business equipment, tax programs as well. How does this proposal change or differ from those incentives in current programs that we've actually enhanced over this past year? Thanks. Yeah, um, you know, first and foremost, I, I just wanna be you know, really clear that I'm really you know, happy that Dr. Evans put this in. I'm not trying to hijack his bill, um, you know, because, you know, he asked me about it, and I, and I like I said, I'm, I'm really supportive of it. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk, uh, you know, after he decided that he might want to move it to three or he may want to move it out of the ETIF. Uh, those things obviously are completely open to interpretation by all of you, uh, just my opinion. Um, honestly, on the apprenticeship program, I, you know, the money going in apprenticeships, I don't know. Uh, any apprenticeship programs that operate like that for the logging industry? I, I, I don't know any, I've never heard of any. I know that there's training programs out there for the community college and stuff like that, which is fine. Uh, once again, I'm not, uh, you know, saying anything negative that, I mean, they all have their place, but, but you know, the, the industry standard, I would say, and I think most people that, um, you know, work, worked in it would, would say that, the way that um, most of us got trained was on the job. And, and it used to be that the industry would allow for that. Um, you know, I trained, I trained my son, you know, uh, I mean, that's how, that's how we, we did it. And, and I mean, he's, he's far surpassed my abilities. I, I don't want to say that, <laughs> but, but, you know, everyone that I worked with back in 86, 87, you know, we're trained the same way and, and I trained an awful lot of people through time. Uh, but it's just that it's so tight now uh, for the, the costs are so extreme that people feel very uh, challenged uh, to take, you know, hours out of the day, hours out of the week to uh, train people, uh, even though they need them. Uh, at the same time, they can't, they can't slow down. And so I, I can't really speak to you know, the apprenticeship programs and stuff like that, because I haven't seen an apprenticeship program that worked in that way. I mean, it would be great if some of that money uh, that we approved actually worked uh, for some of these smaller businesses. But at this point, I see too many uh, people that's probably got, um, inside track on that money that I'm, I'm worried that every day, uh, small uh, workers uh, are not gonna, or small employers are not gonna get, 
you know, the, the help that they need. And that's why I was very happy to uh, join in with Senator uh, Representative Evans on this bill. I do think this is a way to make sure that everyone gets the support uh, that they need uh, across the state. Thank you, President Jackson. Yeah, my dad had no um, luck training me on the skitter. I'm just making that very clear right now. Um, so, but I do want to um, just note that taking it out of ETIF, there may it may be duplicative with some of the other, and there would be no reason that folks would be following the tax committee every single day. But so for the work session, my question is, is our logging companies availed, are able to avail themselves because we heard quite distinctly how difficult it is and the investment that we need to for any of the trades to bring somebody on. I included logging in that, knowing what my dad did. And is would this be duplicative or or in one industry when when there's actually beefed up programs for a lot? So just wanted to make that clear. Thanks so much. I'm sure uh, a little bit longer and, and your dad would have got you to where you needed to be. <laughs> That's very kind, President Jackson. Thank you. <laughs> Seeing no additional questions, uh, thanks for being with us. Senator Jackson, I assume that you'll work with Dr. Evans on uh, the bill and uh, get everybody on the same page with, uh, with the changes that you talked about. Appreciate your time, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Excellent. Uh, so we have... Uh, Additional um, folks signed up to speak in support of the bill, uh, Michelle McLean and Tom Doak. Um, I don't know if Michelle is with us, but let's uh, let's hear from Tom Doak now, and then we'll, if you can promote uh, Michelle McLean, if she's with us. She is with us. She's right here. Oh, she is. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. I didn't see your name on there. Okay. Let's, let's hear from Michelle because she, she was signed up first. Uh, we'll hear from Michelle McLean now with Maine Forest Products Council. Welcome. Um, Ms. McLean, you're on mute still. Can you hear me now? We yes. can. Thank you very much. Apologize. Uh, good morning, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, members of the Taxation Committee. I am Michelle McLean, and I'm here today on behalf of the Maine Forest Products Council to speak in support and favor of LD 1919. Uh, not to take away the thunder of Tom Doak. Uh, uh, obviously, um, we got mixed up in our category in the, the lineup, uh, but he's going to spend quite a bit of time talking to you about a project that we're all involved with um, in the forest products industry, and it's called the Four Main Project. And it's a project that has been focused on growing the main forest um, economy and the workforce. Um, committee report, which he also will reference, is, um, is putting specific highlight on how we as an industry focus on uh, moving forward and a stronger workforce going forth. The council's focus is to recognize our aging workforce as we, as we see it right now and build incentives such as um, legislation like this for attracting young workers and, and uh, creating forest product careers um, so that we have a sustainable industry moving forward. Um, there have been a number of questions and um, Representative Evans um, did make some suggestions for changes um, in the legislation. Um, I we weren't aware about the change from the ETIP to the tax credit program. Um, although we were aware of um, some conversations that he was having about trying to change the number of positions. But what I think it, it does at the end of the day is that it, um, it raises the need for those of us who are interested in this bill and this issue to all come together and have a conversation about what might be best for the industry moving forward as a way to incentivize and address what is um, uh, going to be a need in the future, trying to fill the positions that we do have. We're, we're um, anxious to work with Representative Evans. And happy to answer any questions, but um, very much look forward to working with all the parties involved. Great, thank you for your testimony. Any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for being with us. We'll now hear from Tom Doak from Maine um, 
I mean, Woodland owners. Welcome yes, back. Senator. Thank you, Senator. I'm sorry. Um, yes, welcome back. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, members of the committee. My, my name is Tom Doak. I am the executive director of the Maine uh, Woodland Owners and almost also, for your information, a former director of the Maine Forest Service. Um, I'm, I want to thank Representative Evans for bringing this bill forward. Um, there are, uh, you know, and support um, and support his efforts here to, to address some really important issues. Um, there are a couple, Michelle mentioned the four main project. I'll first mention, I'll first really briefly talk about that. It's a, it's a group of us that were put, put well, got together, includes government officials, landowners, university folks, forest industry people, and how to, how to grow this, how to grow the forest industry. And it came about after some of the mill, some of the major mill closings. And um, we've worked together for the last three or four years and, and um, work and our goal is uh, force industry is about an eight, not $8.5 billion industry in the state. Our goal is to get that to $12 billion by 2025. And we believe that's possible. Um, the resources there, um, the opportunities are there. And the, um, you know, every, if you look at, for example, people are moving away from petroleum products. Everything you make from petroleum can be made out of wood. It's just carbon in a different form. And so there's enormous work going around around the world um, uh, on um, on how to how to use other products other than petroleum based uh, petroleum based make products from something other than petroleum based. Maine has an opportunity. We have a lot of advantages, but there are you know we're competing with everybody. Um, and then I look, you're looking at, we did some work on the workforce and um, 26, looking at the people that are in the forest industry now and it found that 26% of the people in, the, in that workforce and forest industry will be a retirement age and likely to exit by 2030. And that goes up to uh, more than one third by 2035. So we know there's gonna be significant um, need for new employment. And, um, and I can't stress enough that there's a real opportunity here for particularly in parts of rural Maine, but statewide to really grow the economy uh, of Maine. Um, I would say that um, I, the way I read the bill that there was a lot of discussion about logging contractors and loggers and things, but I believe, I believe uh, Representative Evans, your, your purpose was much broader than that and to include a bunch of different other, other businesses, which we certainly would um, support because there are a number of opportunities there for, for wood using uh, industries that could use this kind of assistance. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Questions from members of the committee for Mr. Doak. Seeing none, thank you for being with us. Um, so we don't have anybody else signed to speak in favor of the bill and we have nobody signed up to speak in opposition to the bill, but we do have it looks like five people signed up to speak, neither for nor against the bill, uh, starting with Alexander Price, followed by Dana Duran. Is Alexander Price with us? Looks like he is. Welcome to the committee. Mr. Thank Price. you. Oh, go ahead. Turn on my video here. So right. uh, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, and honorable members of the Taxation Committee. Uh, my name is Alexander Price, and I'm before you today on behalf of the Maine Jobs Council to testify neither for nor against LD 1919, an act to encourage job growth in the forest product sector through tax incentives. The MJC is a new statewide nonpartisan member-driven advocacy organization that advances public policies to support the creation and preservation of foundational jobs in Maine. Maine's regulatory and business environments rank among the lowest in the nation. We are 44th in the nation in overall business um, climate ranking, and 42nd in the nation for overall economic ranking, both of which are among the worst in New England. Maine also lags behind the rest of New England and near the bottom of the nation in capital investment. In contrast, New Hampshire saw nearly triple the investment in Maine in 2019. LD 1919 seeks to amend the Maine Employment Tax Increment Financing Act, although that may be a, a new tax incentive with the, with the amendment, uh, to allow employers engaged in the forest product sector who would otherwise not meet the minimum requirements for participation to be eligible for reimbursement of certain training and other costs. The MGC recognizes that this is a laudable proposal as Maine's forest product sector plays a critical role in our economy. This proposal would certainly support and grow foundational jobs in the forest product sector. 
foundational jobs and sectors like forestry, uh, as well as manufacturing, construction, transportation, energy, farming, fishing, and tourism drive the economy and support the service and public sectors. They also generally provide higher paying quality jobs to support families and sustainably increase the tax base. As such, we support the merits of this proposal. The MJC would note, however, that one of the reasons for our poor economic ranking is the failure of the state to address economic development at the macro level rather than by a piecemeal approach. Too often legislation is viewed and voted in isolation with no regard for the impact on Maine's overall economic environment, foundational jobs, investment, the tax base, and job creation. Maine needs to keep its eye on the big picture and take steps to develop a comprehensive strategy so that we can improve our ratings, attract investment, and support foundational jobs statewide. Nationally, Maine ranks near the top in highest energy costs, highest healthcare costs, and highest tax burden. We encourage state government to take a more comprehensive look at how taxes, regulations, infrastructure, workforce challenges, and other issues act as barriers to job creation. Maine needs to develop and follow a long-term strategic plan that makes us more competitive. The Maine Jobs Council thanks the committee for its time and consideration of these important issues, and we would welcome any opportunity to discuss them with you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Price. Questions from members of the committee? Doesn't look like we have any. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for your testimony. We'll now hear from Dana Duran, followed by Maura Pillsbury. Welcome, Mr. Duran. Great. Thank you, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Taxation. My name is Dana Duran, and I'm Executive Director of the Professional Logging Contractors of Maine. Uh, the PLC, which is our acronym, acronym is a trade association that represents contractors throughout the state, uh, from the smallest sole proprietors with a single employee uh, to as big as 80 employees. We have 200 member companies, which are all small businesses, and they employ over half the people who are employed in, in harvesting and uh, hauling in the state and, and represent 80% of, of Maine's annual timber harvest. Appreciate the opportunity to appear before you. I've provided you written testimony. I'm gonna to try to summarize that for time. Um, I appre we appreciate greatly uh, Representative Evans bringing this bill forward. We weren't involved in the idea generation, but we have had some really good and positive discussions with Representative Evans since he introduced the bill language, just expressing our concerns. And, and uh, so he get, knows and understands what, how, they kinda, how the industry works and, and how this might work for us. Uh, we have met, our board has met, and so, uh, we're not prepared to take a formal position because we do still have some concerns and we wanted to provide some context. Um, and that's why we've decided to come neither for nor against. Uh, before I get into the crux of the bill and where we're coming at it from uh, specifically, let me just give you some background. So all of you know what's happened to the industry over the last decade. We've lost uh, six pulp and paper facilities. We've lost two biomass facilities in Arista County. And most recently in April of 2020, we lost the digester at the J mill. The, date, the J mill and the digester has probably been um, the, the biggest challenge we've seen, even despite those other six closures, because on a single day, we lost a million and a half tons of pulpwood uh, capacity and 500,000 tons of biomass. Just to give you an idea what that means, that's 86,000 truckloads a year uh, went away in, in basically uh, a, a snapshot in time. So as a result, we've seen not only markets, but prices decrease for pulpwood across the state by more than 20%. Um, and they, those prices have been sustained except for some small fuel increases. Uh, we have not seen that come back, even despite global demand for uh, pulp and paper products has actually gone off the charts again over the last year. We're still seeing price decreases and price depression. Um, at the same time, contractors have had to deal with 20 to 50% increases in parts, fuel, equipment, labor, et cetera. Uh, the current model is not sustainable and contractors are at wit's end. This brings me back to the bill before you today. As I said, we greatly appreciate representatives, Representative Evans' attempt uh, to make logging and trucking businesses eligible for the ETIF program. Um, the workforce shortage for loggers and truckers is real and only getting worse. I actually attached to my testimony a 2019 study that we had the University of Southern Maine do on the labor needs for logging and trucking over the next 10 years, as well as what uh, loggers and truckers are paid uh, comparatively against other occupations. You'll note that over 2000 people are needed in our industry in the next decade, but 
Loggers and truckers are paid the least of any like-skilled industry there is. So not only do we see price suppression from where we sell wood, but we also are up against um, the issues uh, for finding people. So let me get specific about the bill. So I expressed to Representative Evans um, the issues with it. So just so you know, you know, in the current ETIF program, it says five employees and it's an incentive to add new equipment to make major investments and to hire new people. This can't be just an, an employment replacement strategy. One employee would create cannibalization in our industry. If every logging business out there could literally hire one person and then use this program in the state to subsidize the hiring of that employee, because of the workforce shortage needs we have, you're gonna see basically a state program cannibalize every logging business. The, the logging businesses who can will basically steal employees and they will use the state in order to pay for that theft. And we can't afford that. We are for tax incentives that help, uh, but we simply can't create a system that has unintended consequences uh, at the end of the day. So we recommended to Representative Evans moving that to three. Three is substantial because for a logging business to add new equipment, they generally will need at least three brand new employees uh, if they're going to make a multi-million dollar investment in their business. And I think that's what ETIF was set up to do was to incentivize growth, not just uh, employment replacement. Uh, secondly, if this program goes forward as written, unfortunately, it will create sole proprietors. Everybody will become a sole proprietor in the business. They'll cut their workers comp and they effectively will create unsafe working conditions because companies will no longer have to carry workers comp because our current workers comp law allows sole proprietors to avoid workers comp. Um, and we don't wanna see that happen either. So we've expressed to Representative Evans, we would be supportive of the bill. If it moved to three employees, we think that is substantial. It would also have to be matched with a substantial business equipment investment uh, in a business and not just again, uh, employment replacement. So with that, I will uh, yield the balance of any time that I may still have, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. A uh, question from Representative Terry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Duran. I appreciate, I appreciate you giving us back our time. <laughs> um, so <laughs> to the workers' comp um, uh, situation, the sole proprietor is a single person, and this would hire this would incentivize them to hire a person and train them, correct? So that, yes, gives them, yes. that gives them an employee and they would be paying workers comp on that employee. I know for my business, I would be. Well, it, it depends. They may not add any employees. They could become a sole proprietor as a business because of this tax credit. And they're basically becoming a new business and they're so, incentivizing themselves. Okay, so the bill itself, though, is for a qualified employee, not just to train somebody, but a, but for a qualified employee, mm -hmm. which is which is part of that. So it would be, in fact, two. There would be at least two employees for that one particular operator. Well, potentially, yes, but again, what we don't want to see ha have happen is that a business essentially becomes a sole proprietor just to take advantage of this. So they set up a, their own business, they call themselves their brand new employee, and they take advantage of this as a growth strategy. Okay, okay thank you. That, that, that's our concern. Uh, Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Duran, good to see you. My, see you uh, as well. My, my question, I guess, is you raised some really good points about cannibalism and um, how we can all of a sudden have uh, a whole bunch more sole proprietors. Do you have any way of working with Representative Evans to come up with a better amended version of this bill to prevent cannibalism and to prevent um, a whole bunch of sole proprietors from emerging from this program? It, it's a valid question. Representative Evans has been terrific. We've been talking to each other for about a month now since the language was introduced. And I, I raised these concerns. You know, our board was very leery of this bill because of the issues with the labor uh, supply and demand problem that's out there. Um, 
so we recommended three. Uh, our other concerns, Representative Beckford, and I know you didn't ask this question. I'll just uh, allude to them. Um, you know, our, our a multitude of things. We, we have a training program at the community college level that currently exists. So uh, training, as you've heard, yes, it's very expensive, but for a lot of contractors now, they're turning to other avenues um, using the community college system for new employees. So it, it's really... It's, a, it's an issue of how do you pay someone? That's why I provided you with those market situation question or uh, information. If we can't afford to pay our employees enough, I, we're concerned that you basically are providing a government assistance to subsidize the, the hiring of new employees. And that puts contractors who aren't aware of programs at, at, at a, a serious um, uh, limitation. So again, these are all issues that we've raised with Representative Evans and we're trying to work through. We feel like the, the, the level of three shows significant investment in a business and it has to be paired with new equipment. This can't be a, you lost an employee and you're just gonna look to, to hire a replacement and you're gonna use this program to subsidize it. So I guess if I can follow up, Mr. Chair, just to uh, follow up, I'm wondering if Mr. Duran, Representative Evans and possibly Mr. Doak can get together and, and maybe work this bill a little bit more with maybe an amended version um, that ties the new employees to new equipment um, and finds a way to keep it from, keep away from cannibalization, keep away from the sole proprietorships that we might encounter and uh, also make this a feasible program that's gonna work and, and make everybody happy. If, if you guys can all agree to do that, I think that we can really move forward with something. Thank you. Yeah, and if I could add to that, Mr. Duran, if you could include Senator Jackson as well, he's got extensive experience, as you know, going back you know, 30 years or longer working in the woods. And he's just seems to be really connected to a lot of people on the ground in Northern Rooster County, small business owners, individual, um, folks that have been working in the woods for a long time. So if you can keep him included as well. He is a co-sponsor of the bill as well, but I think he'd have a lot to add and nothing would make me happier to see you and him and Dr. Evans and everybody on the same page with something that we could move forward with if that's possible. Sure. I meant that his name also, Senator, so thank you. <laughs> uh, Representative Sachs followed by Representative Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Duran, you um, alluded to the ETIF provisions, which have, as of this morning, this program has been taken out of that. Um, I understand that's difficult to do on a moment's notice with testimony, but will you be, do you foresee any significant changes um, in your testimony given that it's now a standalone credit? I, or is I that something you have to bring back? No, I, I think it's a, va a valid question. Um, you know, with respect to ETIF, I'm not going to pretend that I am an expert in any way, shape, or form on, on ETIF. Uh, I'd actually look probably for your expertise on that. My, my basic understanding of ETIF is that it's, it has to be paired with a major business investment. So generally, you know, a business is adding employees, they're new employees, and that probably has some type of an equipment or other investment component to it. Um, as I said before, even if and it's consistent with, with your question about moving the program away from ETIF, um, we would like to make sure that it's paired with some type of business investment so that there's an, 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 an additional investment by the company. To me, that that um, speaks to sound accountability metrics that I think the state should have. Um, the logging business, and, and I, I look at the definitions that are in the bill, this is very specific to logging and trucking and, and road construction. I don't really see anything pertaining to manufacturing at this point, um, but if you're going to add a new employee in, in the logging industry or trucking, it's generally, it happens with equipment. 95% uh, of the industry is mechanized at this point. Um, so mechanization and trucking is all done with equipment. So you have to, if you're going to add an employee, you generally have to add equipment or you have to have equipment that you already own that's parked and you're going to bring it back in some way. Uh, so uh, my, my concern would be just to finish uh, a long-winded response to your short question. Um, 
that <laughs> any additional employees, it has to be paired with some type of, a, of business expansion um, above, above and beyond a baseline. Because again, it goes back to what Representative Bickford just asked me. We're very concerned about cannibalization where the state is effectively just becoming a piggy bank for some who have the ability to charge their expenses back to the state and puts it others at risk. Thank you for the clarification. Representative Collins. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dana. Um, I just wanted to clarify uh, a comment about uh, concerns about workers' comp. It's my understanding that all, all major landowners in the state require anyone doing this work to have workers' comp. Am I, ac am I accurate or has that changed? Uh, very good question, Representative Collins. So current state law says that a contractor does not have to have workers' comp unless they have employees. So if they're a sole proprietor, um, they could get a contract with any landowner, regardless of the size, large landowner, small, if they don't have employees. If they have employees or subcontractors, those employees and subcontractors would, would have to have a workers' comp policy. So again, coming back to you know, a question that Representative Bickford asked, and I'm not sure if you're asking this, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. Um, this could create a situation where a new company is created that gets a contract and they become a sole proprietor. They subsidize their wages. They might hire subcontractors to do the work, but they've effectively created another layer above and beyond. Uh, Representative Collins? I just want to follow up. Uh, my understanding of this bill is that it's to help train um, a much needed new people into this workforce. But are you saying that you think it's it's some way to, for small operators to come out and take advantage? Or do you think this is really about getting new people into the industry, like, you know, especially places in northern Maine where I grew up? Yep. Um, so I think the, the intent is very positive, as I've said. Um, it, I'll give you some st statistics. So we, back in 2015, with the legislature's assistance, created a mechanized logging operations program at the community college level, which has run now for five years. This summer, it's going to have its sixth cohort. And this is for uh, individuals who are out of high school um, because contractors deemed at that point, and it has not changed, it costs $100,000 in the first year to train a new logging operator. That is wages, benefits, uh, lost production, repairs on equipment, et cetera. It's an unsustainable number. So we had to come up with another way in which to train new folks. So we went to the public uh, education system and the community colleges and the legislature partnered with us. Um, so training on new employees in the logging business, um, Contractors, especially right, with, right now with what they're being paid for certain markets, are not willing to take risks on hiring a brand new person who has zero skills. So they really are looking for the, the community colleges or they're looking to hire someone who has experience. Um, and they're not going to take the risk to, to add to their business if they can't do that. So this bill specifically, from our perspective, we just want to make sure that businesses are growing and this is a growth mechanism. It's not just to replace someone. That's, that's our biggest, biggest concern along with creating a bunch of sole proprietors who are skirting the system. Additional questions, members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for being with us again, uh, Mr. Duran. We'll now hear a uh, testimony from uh, Maura Pillsbury followed by Phoenix McLaughlin. Welcome Maura. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, and members of the Committee on Taxation. My name is Maura Pillsbury, and I am an analyst at the Maine Center for Economic Policy. I submit this testimony neither for nor against LD 1919, an act to encourage job growth in the forest product sector through tax incentives. Um, we understand, as Dr. Evans has highlighted, that some changes will be made to this bill, so we are withholding judgment until we see the bill revisions. Um, we appreciate Representative Evans' work in trying to improve opportunities for those in an important sector in our state, and we support efforts to expand access to on-the-job training in critical industries in our state. Um, we have submitted written testimony on the bill as written and look forward to improvements that may address the concerns that we've submitted. Um, our written testimony mainly centered on the need to reform the ETIF program, so I won't read through that 
for you now, um, considering there may be changes taking it out of the ETIF program. Um, and I also wanted to express um, that the committee, um, a desire for the committee to consider overlap with existing apprenticeship programs that um, may be more structured for employees and employers. I know that was brought up that, um, that this may be duplicative of other things the committee has, has already undertaken or programs that have been created um, for industries to expand uh, job training opportunities. Um, so I'm willing to be a resource for you and um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Pilber. Any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for being with us today. Uh, we'll now hear from Phoenix McLaughlin followed by Tony Madden. Welcome Phoenix. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Chipman, Representative Terry, and distinguished members of the Committee on Taxation. My name is Phoenix McLaughlin, and I am the Tax Incentive Policy Manager for the Department of Economic and Community Development. To clarify what that means, I, I manage the Pine Tree Development Zone and ETIF programs, among other things, for the department. Uh, I am here today to testify neither for nor against LD 1919. This, uh, the original text of the bill would create new provisions under the Employment Tax Increment Financing Program, better known as ETF, uh, dedicated to the forest products industry. Businesses in the industry that add new workers would be eligible to receive a variety of reimbursements based on the hours, wages, and training of newly added employees. Our department is very supportive of efforts to bolster the dedicated workers and businesses of the forest products industry. Workforce development is a major priority for creating sustained economic growth uh, and is a primary focus of the economic development strategy that guides our work. Um, some of my comments here are about the original bill text and, and some of the issues that arise attaching the credit to ETIF. Um, hopefully this will be helpful. So as written, the original bill text would create administrative challenges that would need to be addressed. Um, the proposed additions to ETIF would not generally adhere to the existing structure of the program. Currently, businesses qualify for the program by adding five or more full-time employees that meet the income and benefits uh, standards. And for 10 years, the business is eligible to receive payments based on a fixed percentage of those employees' state income tax withholdings. Um, this bill would change the structure for the forest products industry lowering the number of employees needed to qualify, as has been discussed, um, replacing the full-time requirement with an annual hour requirement and changing the allowable benefits. Um, the range of new benefits would be particularly difficult to implement since it separately covers hourly costs for both an employee and their trainer, uh, it covers training equipment and a, a fixed schedule of income tax withholding reimbursement for only three years out of uh, what is usually a 10 year program with ETIF. So clarification would, would be needed to address technical issues with these provisions, such as how to handle employees that train multiple workers, um, and if attached to ETIF, what the reimbursement rate would be for years four through 10. Um, so uh, while we are concerned uh, about the prospect of implementing the, the current original bill text, uh, amending the legislation could improve the proposed uh, program. So setting up the incentive as a, as a separate standalone program, as uh, Dr. Evans has uh, discussed, could, could solve the particular administrative problems that arise from setting the program within ETIF. Uh, but we welcome the opportunity to work with a sponsor and this committee uh, to amend the bill as needed. Um, so thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Question from Representative Terry. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. McLaughlin, for being here um, and helping us work through this. Um, so as amended, uh, as the suggested amendment um, that Dr. Evans brought up um, with taking it out of ETIF and um, uh, putting it as a as standalone um, tax incentive, does it fall in line with the um, uh, economic development plan, the strategic plan that the governor put in place a couple of years ago. Um, and, and specifically, I'm looking at, I'm looking at this from a small business perspective. Um, I understand that large businesses have a number of incentives already. Small businesses, it's a little harder for us little guys to get um, uh, incentives going. Um, 
and that's not to say that everybody needs a little help because every every industry is in trouble at this point. Um, uh, so what I want to know, though, uh, as far as DECD goes, is does this fall in line, as the suggested amendment says, with the strategic plan? Sure. Well, like I said, I, I mean, workforce development overall is a big part of that strategic plan, and, and that's for sure. And, and the reality is that is going to come from a lot of different directions. Uh, some parts are going to need to be smaller uh, more focused bills, which I think this is, or more focused programs, which I think this bill is uh, trying to get at in terms of one particular industry, but it also will need to come through a wider changes to workforce development programs. So uh, I could say, I mean, I don't think there was a part, a specific, you know, paragraph in the strategic plan that spoke to something like this, but it, I would say it's, it's generally related, I would say at least. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, th thank you for being with us, Mr. McLaughlin. That brings us thank to you. our final um, speaker of the day to speak neither for nor against. That's Tony Madden with A.W. Madden. Welcome, Mr. Madden. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you, yep. yep great. Uh, <clears throat> Senator Chipman, Representative uh, Terry, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Taxation. My name is Tony Madden, and I own A.W. Madden Incorporated a third generation logging company in Milford, Maine. My company employs 13 people that help us harvest and transport timber from the forest of Down East Maine. I have been in business 42 years and have worked on many different landowners, including Bureau of Parks and Lands. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify on LD 1919, an act to encourage job growth in the forest products sector through tax incentives. With respect to the bill before you, we greatly appreciate Representative Evans' attempt to make logging and trucking businesses eligible for more favorable income tax treatment under the ETIF Act that is already in statute for other types of businesses. The workforce shortage of loggers and truckers is real and only getting worse by the day because the contractor's inability to pay wages that are competitive with other industries. Representative Evans' legislation adds timber harvesting, trucking, and road construction companies to the ETF program. And those type of companies must, or was only one employee, but I guess now he's amending it to three, but, but I'll continue as if it was with one employee uh, within a one year period after January 1st of 2023 to qualify for the income tax reimbursement. I cannot support the bill as written because it would have a devastating effect upon the industry by encouraging an overused word cannibalism of employees from one contractor to the next whenever one business has the wherewithal to navigate the government bureaucracy to take advantage of the credit. The supply of available workers is simply not high enough based on what contractors can afford to pay to create an incentive for hiring only one employee. Contractors could simply hire an employee away from another company by paying higher wages and then that additional cost to the state through this uh, incentive. At the end of the day, it would create all out warfare over employees and lead to a devastation, devastating impacts. A more meaningful incentive would be for a small business to hire at least three new employees in a two-year period. Not only does this hold accountability for the program, but it also encourages business to make the necessary investments in a company to hire a much more substantial employee base. Again, we are thankful to Representative Evans for bringing this idea forward and hope that we can work with him and the committee to come up with a solution that helps our membership and moves our forest products economy forward. Thank you for the opportunity to speak for you today. And I look forward to further conversation on the topic. Great, thank you for your testimony. We have a question from Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Madden. My question to you is, 
if this gets changed to require um, equipment purchase or substantial investment in the business, um, and it remains at three employees, would that be a better solution for you? It would be. Uh, okay. If it's, gonna, if it's only one employee to hire, um, right. I can see a contractor down the road saying, hey, I, you know, I can pay five dollars an hour more than you, you know, come work for me. And, and, and we're just going to just going to be uh, fighting over the, the few people we have. And and it should require more of a commitment than just uh, throwing some state money out there to to hire people and, and try to raise the raise the stakes. So I yeah, I agree. And, and some of this could be uh, actually we kind of encourage some of this. We want employers to uh, offer more money to get employees and create competition, but in, in the forest products industry, it sounds like it uh, would be de detrimental. So I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Additional questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for being with us, Mr. Madden. I um, believe that concludes everyone, at least that we had signed up to speak. Is there anybody in the waiting room that we think may wanna speak or do we think that's everybody? That's everybody. Yes, that's everybody. Okay, great. Excellent. Well, that, uh, I guess with that, we will close the public hearing on LD 1919, um, which is the final bill we're hearing today. Uh, so that concludes our, our work. Uh, anything you need to let us know about, uh, Julie, before we wrap up for today? Just want to mention that these bills uh, will have a work session on February 10th. That's good. Yeah, we'll work session on February 10th for those that oh. know. Sorry, Go ahead. If I, work if I could, yeah, sorry. If I could jump in. Um, actually, I did want to talk to everybody about February 10th. So we have session that day. Um, and um, in the last session, when we had a work session or a public hearing scheduled for a Tuesday or Thursday and we went into session, we moved everything to Friday. Um, I wanted to get a read from the committee to see um, if that's uh, a feasible day for everybody. Um, and if not, if we could maybe um, start to talk about what day it, uh, does work for the majority of people. Obviously some may not be able to show up, but if we can get at least a quorum going on, on uh, this coming or Friday the 11th anyway, then uh, we can get some work done that week. Is there anybody here today that wouldn't be able to attend on the 11th? If we have work no, session. We'll make it, I'll be fine. Of course, there's some members that aren't with us we'll have to check with, but it seems like we may be able to have a quorum if we did that. Well, I think that makes sense too, because we have to be, we'd be meeting in the morning and then we'd have session in the afternoon and people are gonna need time to, drive to Augusta and we don't know how long the work sessions are gonna go at several bills. Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question, February 11th, I believe it is, is it February 11th or March 11th? We're supposed to have 60% of our bills worked out. What is it, March. Julie? March. March 11th, okay. Yeah. No, no, it, 60% oh. is February 11th. Uh, right. March 11th is 100%. 100%, sorry. Okay, so where are we gonna stand as it stands Whoa. right now? February 11th. So Representative well, Terry and I have kind of mapped out a, a plan, uh, sort of sketched out a plan to have all the bills dealt with by the end of February. So we should be ahead of schedule if everything goes, unless we get more bills referred to us or we need more time on some of them, but we should be able to get through everything by the end of the Feb end of February as it, as it looks right now. Um, Excellent. So we'll be, we'll be in, in time for that deadline. I don't know if we'll hit the 60% deadline, but um, we should be uh, in pretty good shape. Um, Thank you. So I guess with that, anything else, Representative Terry, before we wrap up? No. So uh, if, I, if everybody's okay with it, we'll schedule our what we were going to schedule for the 10th on the 11th. And just if you can't come, if you can let us know as soon as possible, that'd be great. Yeah, we'd meet at nine o'clock on Friday the 11th and we should be done by 12 noon, I would think. But it's five or six bills we have work session on. All right. Well, with that, we will conclude this meeting of the Committee on Taxation, and we'll see everybody on um, Thursday. Great. All right. Have a good one, everyone. Have a good day. See ya.